Who have access to space? Have you ever wondered? Humankind has always been fascinated by the final frontiers, what's up there and actually how to get there. At least I was, as a young kid, looking at the stars. And that's why I became an engineer, actually really fascinated by machines and actually transportation means. And if you think about it, every time there has been a new transportation mean, it has been a revolution. Just think about boats with international trade, trains, planes. In the 21st century, it's going to be about reusable rockets that will really reshape the economy around it. Because space, what about space? Space is big, of course. Many claim that it's limitless. It's, you have unlimited possibilities. But actually, the ones that put numbers Actually, Bank of America said it's over uh, $1.4 trillion economy by the end of the next decade. But once again, how we go there? The only way to getting there is with rockets. But if I ask you one more time, who has access to space? Until now, some, as you might know, wealthy individuals and very um, few countries have reached orbit today. The thing is, it's hard. and. Uh, bottleneck is still the rocket launch. That's, if you think about it, launch companies today, they try to do it all. They, have, they want to do everything on the industry, from the most complex parts, rocket engines, rockets, the infrastructure, the launch pads. It's nonsense. You need a lot of money. And verticalization actually brings to this, that you cannot accelerate everything. So, if you think about it, every time there's an industry that matures, specialists appear. If you look at this beautiful picture of an orchestra, everyone has a very specific job and they master the instrument. And when you listen at the, the overall, it just sounds marvelous. So once again, imagine Airbus building planes, um, the engines, the airlines, and the airports. This is exactly what is happening in the launch industry. Not only that, but what about sustainability? You're looking here at a very beautiful picture of a European institutional launcher called Vega that utilizes solid propellant, which they work perfectly, but they really are, leave some nasty elements in the upper layer of the atmosphere. And the privatization of space, it's about volume. If you want to keep up the demand, reusability and sustainability will be key. So if we wrap it up at Pangeo Space, we focus. We focus on hardware. We don't want to do it all. We want to excel on the hardware, not operating it. And if we break it down more specifically, we concentrate on one of the most complex part, which is the engines, propulsion. And as a propulsion engineer myself, let's break it down to Earth and do a Rocket Propulsion 101. So you can see on the lower part how a conventional rocket engine looks like, this bell-shaped one. And as the rocket goes up, the plume, the gases, there is a limit. They cannot expand more because they have the constraint of the walls. So we are working on a new type of rocket engine called the Aerospike considered the holy grail of propulsion. NASA theorized about it long ago, but it was super expensive to manufacture and actually very complex to cope with all the technical challenges. But the aerospike, the big difference, as you can see, this V-shaped one, is that the plume, the gases, can freely expand. And this free expansion gives you more performance. But this, it's theory. Theory is always good. but. What about reality? What I brought here is a real rocket engine. And I'll actually encourage you to pass at our booth if you want to know more. So this was the first aerospike engine utilizing methyl ox, so methane and oxygen, to ever work in history. We tested last year. We've proven its reusability for several firings. We even went to steady state. That means that that thing just can go on and on if you have enough propellants. And most importantly, we have did it with peanuts less than three years, and under two million euros. And, oh, sorry. It works. But the video doesn't work, sorry for that. But I encourage you to take a picture and to scan that QR code to actually see more geeky footage on when we tested in Lampelshausen in the German Space Agency last year. But this is the past now. This was to prove 
that we can do it. This is the future, Arcos. This type of engine will be the first orbital aerospike engine. And as I said, it's performance boost, which can give you up to 15% more efficiency, translate into more payload, more payload into orbit, more happy clients, because agencies, institutions, and, lock and rocket players can put more stuff to orbit, more revenues, they'll be happy, we will be happy. And this is just thanks to the aerospike. It's a scalable product, so we can really serve multiple um, markets and scale down the, the thrust up and down. And of course, it's optimized manufacturing process to actually have fewer parts, lower cost, and faster to produce. But not only that, as we say, reusability and sustainability for us is important. That is why we are already utilizing biomethane, because your carbon footprint can be almost zero to use it. And actually, to foster that sustainability and reusability, you can even, as my colleague just said before, in the future, have methane done in the moon and Mars. So you will need to actually uh, master those, those propellants. And reusability. Our engines, thanks to its shape, eases reusability. So it's easier to come back to Earth and land. So foster sustainable space is possible, and it's an obligation that we have if we really want to keep up the demand and still keep launching more and more stuff to orbit. And this, it's already happening. We already have traction. We have LOIs, we have RFIs, RFQ, even two contracts that people already believe in our technology and um, are willing to develop with us our product line. And we're not doing that alone. We have, as you could see here, world-class stakeholders. We have, for example, with NASA, uh, an exclusive license of a very interesting copper alloy, the one that it's made this, this engine. And we are one of the few launcher company technologies invested by two governments, in our case the Spanish one and the French one. We are based in Barcelona, Spain and Toulouse, France. And if we want to wrap it up, of course we're here because we want to show everyone that this type of propulsion is now possible, the holy grail of propulsion. We are currently fundraising, that is why we're here. But I want to ask you one last time to all of you, who can access space? Because with us, any one of you could. Thank you.